Hi, welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to talk about this rotary encoder. So a rotary encoder, unlike a potentiometer, is a device that allows us to detect change in the position of this knob. And not only that, but this knob can be turned uh, indefinitely, uh, as many rotations as you like. Uh, there is no end to the ability to rotate this knob. Unlike the potentiometer, which in this case here, for example, uh, it's not even able to do a full revolution. It's got about uh, maybe 330 degrees uh, ability to turn. So uh, a couple of things about the rotary encoder before we go into uh, the details and the um, implementation of um, our sample circuit. So there's a few different types of rotary encoders. Uh, the most common one is this one here. It's uh, a conductive uh, rotary encoder. Uh, it uses uh, conductive pads on a disk, so I'm going to show you in a minute. And um, the, the device can detect the direction of the move, so whether the knob is being turned clockwise like that or anti-clockwise by looking at the pulses that the conductive pads on the disk generate. Uh, we are going to have a look at this later using uh, my oscilloscope just uh, to see how these pulses are generated and how then we can read them. Another type of potentiometer, of, sorry, another type of uh, rotary encoder is the optical type, uh, which typically uses um, a laser or a photodiode to detect pulses and uh, as a result, uh, direction and speed of move. And those tend to be a little bit more expensive, but they are a lot more accurate. Uh, there are also magnetic type rotary encoders. Um, those are typically used in applications where uh, the, the the mechanism that does the reading needs to be uh, completely isolated from the environment, uh, typically and uh, maybe a uh, high heat or uh, high intensity uh, applications. Uh, so those are not very accurate, but uh, if you have, uh, say, if you are trying to detect um, rotation um, in an engine when the engine heats up then perhaps uh, conductive pads or even uh, optical means will not do so we use magnets to keep distance from uh, whatever the, the heat is generated we can also divide rotary encoders into two general types uh, there's the absolute and incremental types now the one that i'm holding here is uh, an incremental type so the encoder will report change only but not the actual position of the knob so for example here let's say i'm going to to rotate the um the knob so that this is parallel say with this and i'm going to call this zero degrees if i turn the knob slightly to uh anti-clockwise like that then the knob will now report that i've turned I've turned it uh, by one knob counterclockwise, but it's not going to give me an actual degree reading. So it's not going to say that this is, for example, a five degree change in rotation. Um, if I turn it, say, three times this way, then that's what the device is going to, return, to report. The fact that I turned it by uh, three positions uh, towards one direction or the other. On the other hand, an absolute encoder is uh, not going to report just the the number of uh, clicks or positions that I've turned it, but also its exact position. So if I turn the knob all the way, say this way, then the device is going to return uh, a reading of, let's say 90 degrees of whatever that, that might be. Uh, the other nice thing about absolute encoders is that uh, the device knows its position um, even after power has just been restored. So there is a mechanism inside that, uh, that reports the accurate position of the encoder. Um, in most cases, we don't really need that kind of capability. We just need to know that uh, the user has turned the knob um, and by how many uh, positions. And uh, for those uh, cases, uh, an incremental encoder is perfect. This particular one uh, only costs about a dollar to get. So very cheap, versatile, and they last for a long time. A couple of other things worth mentioning. 
is that incremental encoders can be very accurate. Uh, the one that I'm holding here, even though it's cheap, uh, has, has got an accuracy of 20 positions per revolution. So there are 20 positions that uh, I, can, uh, I can rotate uh, the knob and those uh, will be reported uh, to my sketch. So 20 positions. You can go to, um, you can get incremental encoders with accuracy up to maybe a thousand, even, even 10,000 in some cases, positions per full revolution. Of course, uh, the more accuracy you get, the more expensive the encoder is. Um, this particular type, it's a mechanical encoder because it's got all these little um, physical uh, contacts inside uh, its case will need debouncing like we've seen in other lectures and um, in the circuit that uh, I'll display and demonstrate later I'm going to do both hardware and software uh, debouncing to get a reliable reading out of it otherwise uh, as we'll see in the first experiment they can be very unreliable the optical type is uh, more expensive, as I said earlier, than the mechanical one, but it offers a lot more accuracy and um, higher speeds. So if you are using it in an application where that knob can turn very, very fast, probably m not by um, human hands, but by some other mechanical apparatus that turns it, then an optical encoder will be more suitable for such an application. Finally, the kind of applications that we see um, used um, in, with rotary encoders, um, things like uh, servo motors, um, robot vehicles, where you, know, you need to have uh, the ability to detect uh, the, uh, the degree by which a wheel of the robot, for example, has turned exactly, uh, or as uh, control devices. Um, in consumer electronics, when you've got things like um, the control of the volume or the frequency knob in, in home or car stereos, those things are implemented typically with rotary encoders. Okay, enough with the introduction. Let's go ahead and build um, a first circuit. Uh, it's going to be just bare bones circuit without any debouncing at all, just to get an idea of the behavior of the bare bones uh, rotary encoder. So the encoder has got these five contacts. So there's the ground, then there's power. Um, the one in the middle for this type is a switch or a button. So if I press it, I've got a button implemented here. So that press will be reported by the pin in the middle. And I've got uh, two contacts as well. This report movement. So there's DT and clock. Um, before moving ahead, it's actually worth uh, doing a little bit of a drawing to explain what is happening inside the case of the encoder. So I'll put these things aside and uh, get a bit of paper and see what's going on here. So inside the case of the encoder, there is a disk. So so here's a disk and uh, this disk is divided in this model. I know that because there are two pins that are reporting movement it is divided in two parts. Here's the first part and here's the second part. Uh, along those uh, parts of the disk we've got conductive pads. So I'll just make it with just three conductive parts per circle. In reality, this particular one has got uh, 20. That's why you can have a report of 20 positions. So I'm just gonna have three only. So that's the inside uh, part of the disk and that's the outside part of the disk. And you can see that I've got a, tw uh, a 90 degree phase between the two conductive parts. So that's the outer region, part of the circle. Okay, and here's the last one. Now imagine that we've got a couple of wires uh, and uh, I'll just make them stick like this. Here's the first one and I'm gonna call that, let's say, DT, 
just to match the readings of the first pin and then I'll make the second one like that as uh, CLK. So now imagine the, the disk turning, let's make it counterclockwise like that. As the disk is turning, the, um, uh, the, the two pins will be reporting the, uh, either a 5 volt or a 0 volt or ground um, voltage uh, depending on the position. So at this very position here, of course, we're going to have a 1 uh, uh, for DT and a 1 for clock. Now imagine this turns a little bit more uh, and we've got one pad here. I can make this the clock and the other one here. I can make this uh, DT. Then this is going to report 0 and 0. Now if this turns a little bit more, um, the first one that is going to come into contact with the uh, with a conductive pad will be DT. So DT is going to go to 1 and at the same time where DT becomes 1 for the first time, CLK is going to be 0. I just want you to imagine that these two are exactly aligned. I've, I've made them separated just to make it a little bit easier to see but in reality they would be the one right after the other. So here's, let's make this to be DT and right on top of it there would be CLK. So they are sampling at the exact same position. Now a little bit later as the, the wheel is turning the um, the DT is going to run out of conductive pad and it's going to become zero while CLK is still on its own conductive uh, pad and it's going to be still it's going to be a one. So you can see that when the wheel is turning, when the disc is turning counterclockwise, this is what's happening. Uh, DT is becoming one first while CLK is still zero and then when they exit on the other side of the pads uh, DT is going to become zero first and uh, CLK is going to still be one until eventually it becomes zero and both of them are zero in between um, pads. Now imagine that we've got the clockwise movement now it goes like this so I'm just going to say clockwise here. I'm going to uh, use the two sampling pins. So here is uh, this is CLK and very close it's going to be DT. So as the wheel is turning counterclockwise you can see that CLK is becoming one first because this conductive pad comes into contact with CLK first. So I'm going to go for CLK1 and then at the same time uh, the DT pin is still zero right? because this conductive pad hasn't reached the, the reading head here at this position. Now the, uh, CL, the, the disc will turn a little bit more. CLK is going to still be one and eventually DT is going to become one course this area is going to reach the the reading head and then a little bit later when uh, the CLK head goes past this point of the conductive pad CLK is going to be zero while DT is still at this position is still right on the conductive pad so it's still one and eventually both of them are going to reach this um, unpadded area where both of them are going to be zero and zero. So from the point of view of the pulses that the Arduino will have to read, if the disk is running counterclockwise or anticlockwise, then DT from both being down, DT is going to be the first one to go up and um, at the same time, so this is DT, at the same time CLK is still down here at the bottom at the ground level when eventually its pad reaches a conductive area so its, read, its um, uh, pin reaches a conductive area and eventually it goes up. 
so C L K. And um, some point DT is going to go down, and a little bit later C L K is also going to go down. So one. 0, 1, 1, 1, sorry, uh, 0 at this point, it goes down to 0, and then we have 1, and eventually we got 0 and 0. Now on the other side, the exact opposite thing happens. If the rotation is counterclockwise, and let's say dt is down at the bottom at ground, um, so this is dt, and this is cl. Okay, let's start with both of them down. Now the first thing, the, the first one that's going to go up is going to be CLK. So CLK is going to go up while DT is still at the ground level. And uh, eventually DT is also going to go up like that. Continue at high. Now then the first uh, of the two that will go down is CLK. And a little bit later clock, oh sorry, DT will also join it down. So we've got uh, 1, 0, and 1, 1, and this is 1, this is now going down to 0, and eventually we've got 0 and 0. Now this is the principle of operation, and this is the, the type of pulses that we'll have to take advantage when we want to read uh, readings out of the uh, rotary encoder. So with all this said, Let's go and build the first circuit.